He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The seed is the word of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Since our Lord himself explains the gospel parable today, I thought I would give a sermon about sermons. Sermons in the plural, because each Sunday Mass offers us, in effect, two, a true two-edged sword, which is the symbol of the greatest preacher of all time, whom we commemorate today, St. Paul the Apostle. And this two-edged sword pierces the heart of man and the heart of God at every Mass. At lunch on Friday, Father Chicada was telling us a story about um, or parish in the old days where, as we do, one priest preached all of the masses every Sunday. And as it happened, the pastor was a Monsignor, and a Monsignor who was rather pleased with his own preaching. He happened to be outside greeting the parishioners before Mass when a little old Irish lady, quite blind, toddled up to him. Now, she used a hearing aid, and without the hearing aid, she couldn't really hear anything, and she heard the voice of one of the priests, she didn't know who. She said, begging your reverence's pardon now, who'd be given the sermon this morning? Well, the Monsignor said, it's the Monsignor himself. Oh, thank you, she says, and then she reaches up with sort of a shaky hand and turns off the hearing aid and goes into church. Father Chicada himself had an interesting sermon experience once in Manhattan. We used to offer Mass, you see, every Sunday afternoon at the Warwick Hotel in New York City, and because it's New York, we did have our fair share of, well, crazy people who would come to Mass sometimes. There was one person, he said, who would go up and down the line. Sometimes the people would fight. Imagine that. They would fight in the line for confession as to whose place it was. And then one person would go up and down the line telling the people waiting to go to confession, you know that priest breaks the seal of the confessional, which was a little disarming, especially for newly ordained priests. Well, one day Father is just giving the announcements after the gospel. He hasn't even gotten to the sermon yet when there's a voice from the back of the congregation crying out, hey, cut that out and bring on the communion. Why is it that we have a sermon before that, the consecration and the communion and the principal parts of the Mass? And why is it that we have epistles and gospels read to us? Once in Latin, in any case, and very often in English, too. And what about all those little ceremonies, which you see especially at a high Mass, which surround the holy words. What do they mean? The living word of God, the Son of God teaches today, is the seed. It is cast each Sunday into the soil of our hearts. It's a source of life, the life of faith. Only after our Lord, as teacher, has shown the way to heaven, does our Lord, as priest and victim, open the gates of heaven, and that by dying on the cross, mystically renewed on the altar. Now, all of this is repeated at each Mass, first by his preachers, Old Testament prophets sometimes, or else the apostles. Then he himself ascends the pulpit, and he speaks the words of eternal life, his gospel before he descends to the altar to give that life in the consecration to us. So, altar, pulpit, inseparably linked in the Catholic Church. The priest who offers the sacrifice proclaims the heavenly doctrine because knowledge is the beginning of salvation. The epistle, you know the word means letter. It symbolizes particularly the prophets of the Old Testament or the apostles, such as today's 
St. Paul, who gives us, in effect, sort of his, his life story. All of these apostles or prophets, first of all, spoke to the Jews, God's chosen people, attempting to enlighten them, or, as in the case of today's epistle, St. Paul is fighting against the Judaizers who want to corrupt the Christian gospel. He's contending with them. But they always have their eye on Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah. And that is why the epistle is said or sung, not facing the people, but facing the altar, because the altar means Christ. Our Lord is the true rising sun, the true orient, and he sheds his light upon us. That light which comes, Zachary says in Luke, that light which comes to enlighten them that sit in darkness in the shadow of death. At a high mass, you sit for the epistle, and that is meant to symbolize the state of the world sitting in darkness before the coming of the light our Lord. At a low mass, the people properly remain kneeling. That's a gesture of humble acceptance and, of course, very great respect. At a low mass, too, Father will put his hand, the left hand out, to indicate to the altar boy the epistle's over, and then he must give the response, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. Then the priest reads, the high mass, the choir sings too, some verses from the Psalms organized as a gradual or an alleluia or a tract, it's called, kind of an intermezzo, just a little moment of meditation before the gospel. But before the gospel, the priest leaves the epistle side of the altar to go to the other side, and then he pauses in the middle for humble prayer You can tell it's humble because he makes a profound bow. And then he says, you can read that in your Missal, the Munda Kor, purify my heart and my lips, O Lord, as thou didst purify the lips of the prophet Isaiah, with burning coal from the altar which is above. Why does he do that? Before our Lord began his public life, he went first to the desert, for 40 days of retreat and of preparation by fasting and by prayer. And all of this means humility. So the priest, following Christ's example, prepares himself humbly to acknowledge his own unworthiness before he says those so holy words of the gospel. You should too, so the soil of your heart will be readied to receive the seed of his word. The gospel means the good news from the Anglo-Saxon, of course, and it is the preaching of our Lord. So why is the book changed from one side to the other? For why do we go from right to left? We go from the Old to the New Testament. But there's more to it than that. Christ came to preach to his own people, the Jews, but they rejected him and his teaching, and they put him to death. The apostles then went to the Gentiles with God's grace. This St. Paul is called the doctor, the teacher of the Gentiles. And this is symbolized at each Mass by the changing of the book, because you have refused the word of God, St. Bonaventure tells the Jews, we carry it to the Gentiles. This is interesting, and of course it's quite unecumenical. One of the first changes, those of a certain age will remember it, is that the epistle was no longer read at the altar, but the priest had to go sit down on the side, and then a lay person would come up and read the epistle instead. Now, when the altar boy gets to the other side with the big book, the missal, how is it placed? Not parallel, the way it sits on the epistle side for the start of Mass, but it's placed at an angle, symbolically facing the north, because the, every Catholic altar symbolically at least faces the east. Our altar doesn't actually, because of the lay of the land, we couldn't build the church that way, but 
it stands for the east, and then therefore that little corner, that's towards the north, because the north is the devil's side. It's the side of the cold and the side of pagans and of barbarians throughout the centuries and of darkness. And so the gospel being read that way is a bit like the church taking her greatest and most powerful cannon and weapon, and she aims the weapon at Lucifer and all of his followers to give them a blast of God's power. Why do you stand up when the gospel starts? Out of respect for Christ, just as you would when anyone enters the room, particularly someone worthy of respect, or for the priest, beginning at the ending of the Mass, we stand. Christ comes at this moment. I can't overemphasize this. We're not listening to the words of a man. You know the Novus Ordo teaches that the Gospels are myths, the product of a committee, a certain amount of propaganda, of course, is, is built in, so take it with a grain of salt. No, that's a lie and a heresy, one among many. The Gospel is the living and the life-giving word of the Son of God, and that it is true. For St. Francis, furthermore, and the Christians of the Middle Ages, the, the gospel is, is a concrete divine presence, kind of a focal point of God's power. Merely pronouncing these words puts devils to flight. That's why in, in Mexico, a priest won't just be asked, if I, visit, if I visit a classroom, some of the children will say, your Excellency, could you give us your blessing? They'll do that for any priest. But in Mexico, they don't just ask for a blessing. If they're ill or they have a particular need, they'll say, Padre, reza me los evangelios. Father, pray me the Gospels. And you're meant to pray a little snippet of the start of the four Gospels because of their power. Same thing with the old German custom of the Rogation Day processions to bless the fields in the spring. He'd stop in four different directions and read again the start of the four Gospels. And sometimes for Corpus Christi, the same. These words have the power to heal the sick. St. Francis found that they even solved civil strife and brought an end to riots and put demons to flight. God is here by his word. It's not just human instruction. It's not just exhortation. There's a divine presence, a reality, the sacred. And that's why the gospel is all surrounded with the signs of the cross. Why do we do the three little ones, the start of the gospel, the Father? For Christ's words to be in my mind, for his words to be my words on my lips, for his words to be in my heart and cherished and kept, carried there. And at the very start of the gospel, you will notice that Father makes with his thumb the sign of the cross on the page, approximately where the holy name of Jesus is to be found, if possible. And these crosses are because our Lord has confirmed, he has sealed his teaching by his death on the cross. You can't separate them. The preaching and then the sacrifice. The cross is the seal of his gospel. And at the end, here's a lesson for St. Valentine's Day coming up. He kisses the text. And what is a kiss meant to be if not the supreme gesture of reverent and holy love? and of true cherishing. At Solemn High Mass, uh, the, the clergy make a little procession, and the deacon carries a book, and the gospel book out of reverence has jewels and ornamentation upon it. And at uh, every Mass where there's incense, the altar boys carry their candles because the light of the world is coming. And then this is the first time historically, that incense was used in Mass. Incense used to be carried before an emperor, but the king of kings is coming now, and so incense is carried before him, and his book, his gospel, his word is thus honored. Finally, we get to the sermon. At the sermon, 
frequently the sermon is given during Mass at some of the low Masses. It's before Mass at our church. At the sermon, the choir sings a hymn to invoke God's assistance. The celebrant will remove usually his chasuble and his maniple, the arm piece here, because those are not strictly speaking Mass vestments, and the sermon is strictly speaking outside of Mass, although linked with it. And it also symbolizes the freedom of the gospel. So if the priest wants to get a bit carried away in his preaching, he's not impeded by the heavy vestments. He may do so. But he always wears a stole, a regular priest does, or the celebrant of the Mass, because this little scarf-like vestment stands for the authority of the priest. A bishop may as well preach outside of Mass in his bishop robes, called his choir robes or dress. He goes into the pulpit. That comes from the Middle Ages. It's just a practical thing, so you can see and hear the preacher better. But its height is meant to make us mind the things that are above, St. Paul says. And it is symbolic as well of the dignity of the preacher because he is the ambassador of God. Then a prayer, everything with a prayer. St. Louis de Montfort gives many reasons why we should say a Hail Mary before the start of a sermon. St. Francis says that Our Lady is the spouse of the Holy Ghost. That's the best way to receive the divine inspiration and assistance. Then Father makes the announcements briefly, if possible, because we have a wonderful bulletin for you to read, and you'll learn many things by looking at your bulletin and keeping it. And then oftentimes the epistle, or at least the gospel, will be read in English. Why is that if you already have a leaflet in your hand or maybe a prayer book, and we've just done it in the official language of the Latin? Why times? Well, partly for the sake of the servers of the choir or those who might be distracted, and for all of our sake, because it's one thing to read the sacred text, it's another thing to hear it read, to listen to it. And listening, hearing it, you're meant to retain it, to remember it. Why are the Gospels repeated year after year? In the Novus Ordo, they always have something different. Well, they've removed, of course, the ones that aren't politically correct. But for the rest, there's always something, some new cycle going on. In the true Mass, it's repeated every year because we can never exhaust these truths. These Gospels are chosen under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. And this way, too, we can get to know these Gospels. We remember snippets and phrases, as well as their idea and teaching. They become part of us, that little sign of the cross on the head, and here in the heart. Then the priest gives his text, a text he might explain in his sermon, or which at least inspires it. And he makes, again, the sign of the cross to start. And that is in order to banish the devil who is waiting in this church, lest believing you should be saved, he's around to take those words out of your heart. Why do we have sermons? Did you ever think about that? Since the Council of Trent, it has been obligatory that every Sunday Mass there should be a sermon. Sometimes people do think about that. Sometimes there are Catholics who are careless, in making it in time for a sermon, or calculating in missing one. Probably they are the ones who could use it most. The Word of God is the food of the soul. It sustains your spiritual life. If you have no appetite, that's a sign of spiritual sickness. And if you stop eating, that's a sign you have started the process of dying. How does preaching work? It enlightens the understanding and stirs up our will to do what is good. Acting on, St. Jerome says, the soil of the soul like a plow going through the hard surfaces and rooting up those big old weeds, the thistles of vice. Those who are indifferent to God's word expose themselves to the risk of spiritual death damnation. Last of all, how should you hear the word of God, a sermon? I have four Ps for you, and the first of these is prayerfully, with a prayer for the preacher, and a prayer for yourself. And if you're getting a little antsy or distracted, 
just say some Our Fathers and Hail Marys for those two intentions. Secondly, hear the sermon patiently, not critically. Thirdly, hear the sermon personally. Don't apply it to somebody else. Apply it to yourself. And fourthly, hear the sermon positively. The worst sermon in the world still has something to offer you. Listen for it. St. Francis once said, one of the reasons he loves the birds, I think he was thinking of blackbirds in particular, is, is because they'll peck through animal dung to find the seeds. And if it's just animal dung, it doesn't matter. There could be some seeds there, and besides, the dung is good for fertilizing the soil of God's word. It is never going to be wasted. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Don't turn it off, but listen so that you may bear fruit in patience. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.